Father, we do thank you for tonight. We're not taking anything for granted. We're not taking your love, your grace, your mercy for granted tonight. We appreciate you. We love you. We honor you. We surrender. We submit unto you. And we pray, Lord, you send your spirit to open our eyes and to understand exactly what Jesus, our Savior, is emphasizing in the study of tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, we'll not switch over to our own understanding, to our own religiosity, and to our own opinion in Jesus' name. When Jesus speaks, there is but one thing to do, just to be. And Lord, we pray as for the heavenly mansion suicide, and we want to get there eventually. We pray that your real salvation will be ours in Jesus' name. The grace to understand, the grace to obey, whatever you are teaching and revealing to us, Give us that grace tonight in Jesus' name. We pray there will be no argument in our heart. There will be no subtraction addition in our heart. There will be no going back to tradition in our heart. Let your word be your word in every life tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And deeper lives said, Amen. God bless you. We're coming to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Tonight we're studying from chapter 10, verse 17, all through to verse 31. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And when he was come forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? A great question. The most important question. The greatest question any man could ask. And thank God he asked from the right person. He asked the question from the giver of eternal life. He asked the question from the one who has been from all eternity and is still here on earth at that time and then will be going to eternity. If anyone knew anything about eternal life, it's Jesus. The Father actually has ordained him and has sent him to grant eternal life to everyone that will come to him, listen to him, obey him, believe him, and walk in the way of Christ. And so the man did right in coming after Christ, and actually he was running. He didn't want to miss the opportunity. Christ is passing by, I must get to him. This question is burning in my heart. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why don't you go and ask the priest? No, they don't have eternal life themselves. Why don't you go and ask the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They do not know the way to have eternal life. Why don't you go to the synagogue? Why don't you read your Bible, the Old Testament? Why don't you fast and pray? I've done quite a lot of things, but I'm still confused. I'm in the dark. I do not understand. And he got to Jesus and he knelt down before him and he said, Master, not just master, good master, what shall I do? I, I'm not saying what will the church do? What will the synagogue do? What will religious people do for me that I might inherit eternal life? It's in your hand. It's what you do. It's what you believe. It's what you embrace. It's how you live. It's the grace you yourself receive from the Lord. What shall I do that I, whatever others do, whatever others have, whatever others miss, whatever others possess, whatever others do not possess, I, that I may inherit eternal life. I've got the best of things in this life, 
But the life here is short. I've got riches. I've got popularity. I've got a name. I've got a profession. I've got some provision. In fact, I'm so rich at my young age that people envy me. But there is still something I'm thinking about. When life is over, when the short, brief life here has come to an end, and I go to the great beyond, I'm interested to know what shall I do that when it comes to that time and I cross over to the other side, that I may inherit eternal life. Have you ever thought about that? Do you think about that at the height of your position? Do you think about that at the height of your privilege? Do you think about that, that for you in particular, don't throw it to another person now, life on earth will not be forever. Whatever your position, whatever your possession, whatever your place, whatever your popularity, whatever it is you think, this is what I have here on earth. Life will not continue forever. Everyone will get to the other side eventually. When you go to the other side, where will you be? Where will you spend eternity? Those who are full of themselves and they are blindfolded by what they have on earth, they don't ever think about eternal life. But you must think about it. That's why you came and you come to the right place. Because we're going to look at the words of Jesus. And this giver of eternal life will talk to you. And he will tell you very clear, in clear terms, what should you do that you may inherit eternal life. Tonight, we're considering the message, Christ's revealed condition of inheriting eternal life. Christ's revealed condition of inheriting eternal life. As we see the answer he gave to the man, and the response of the man. And then how Christ revealed to him what he must do, that there will be no impediment, no hindrance in his way to get to life eternal. And then we see the reaction of the man. Then after he has reacted, we find the final revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting everything together, here are three points we're talking about tonight. Number one, receiving eternal life through faith in Christ. Receiving eternal life through faith in Christ. Number two, reaping eternal loss through focus on the corruptible. All the things in this world are corruptible. The silver the gold, the riches, the property, everything we can see, everything tangible, everything we can possess, everything we can hold on to, everything we work for, everything on earth, corruptible, because it can rust, it can be lost, and we don't take them beyond the grave. And yet, there are people that focus their lives, they focus their attention, they focus their heart, and they focus everything they've got on the corruptible. And they reap eternal loss, reaping eternal loss through focus on the corruptible. Point number three, retaining eternal life. It's one thing to have, it's, one, it's another thing to retain. It's one thing to possess, it's another thing to keep. And how do we retain, how do we keep eternal life once we have received? Retaining eternal life through fellowship with the crucified. Christ, the crucified. Crucified to the world, crucified to everything on earth, separated from the world 
and separated from every sin on earth, holding the sins of the world with a loose hand that if any sin on earth will compete with the eternal life you've got, you rather give up that, be crucified to that, be crucified to the world, and then you retain eternal life. Point number three, retaining eternal life through fellowship with the crucified. We're coming to point number one, receiving eternal life through faith in Christ. We're coming to Mark chapter 10. Verse 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled down, kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do? The time he heard eternal life. And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That he is God. This young man that came, this rich man that came, this religious man that came, wasn't looking at Jesus as God. He was looking at him as a man, as a prophet. As the prophets of old, some said he was like Elijah. Some said he was like all the men, good men, great men, Good teachers, great teachers of the Old Testament. And coming with that understanding, and coming with that conception that this is a good teacher, a good master, a good leader, a good prophet. That's why Jesus said, you look at me as man, there's no man that is good. You look at me as a teacher. There's no man that is naturally good as a teacher. Why callest thou me good? There is none that is good except God. Good by nature, good by character, good by life, good by everything he professes, and good by everything he does. In any case, verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, one. Do not kill, two. Do not steal, three. Do not bear false witness, four. Defraud not, five. Honor thy father and mother, six. You see that Jesus Christ took the commandments of the second table of the Ten Commandments, the two tables, the force containing your duty to God. The force containing your honor for God. Your, the force containing your faith, implicit faith, unwavering faith, unchanging faith, unadulterated faith in the Lord Almighty and acting in accordance with your faith, your submission unto God. But it took the second part, which is your duty to man. And you'll see what Christ has done. Christ did not go in line with number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten. He changed the ordering. Why? Because the man had been reading that quite a lot. What you read very often, when it's quoted to you in that same line, you just gleam over it, gloss over it, and you do not have real conception. So the Lord said, how about this? Do not commit adultery. Think about that. Do not kill. Think about that. Do not steal. Think about that. And do not bear false witness. Think about that. Honor your father and your mother. Think about that. And he answered and said, Unto him, master. He got some correction here. Instead of saying good master, this time now, he just said, master. I see you're a teacher, and you said, there's no one that is naturally good. All right, learn from that. And so you yourself, 
if you have removed the good from the master, remove the good from your own life too. You are not naturally good. You are rotten. Even though you are religious, you are not acceptable to God. There is something you must still do. And that is faith in Christ, in the Savior. All your good works cannot save you. But he said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Why did he love him? God so loved the world, everyone, the good and the bad, the rotten and the righteous, the left-handed and the right-handed, the blind and the seen, the saved and the unsaved. He loved everyone. And this one ran, and this one came to him, and this one kneeled down. And this one said, I've been trying my best. He actually wanted eternal life. And so Christ loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Before I read that verse, that verse fully, let's come to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew Chapter 19, the same story, but there's something here we need to observe. Matthew chapter 19, and then from verse 18, and he says unto him, which he had asked him to keep the commandments, and he said, Well, Jesus said, Thou shalt thou shall do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And there's a conclusion now of those commandments in the second part of the Ten Commandments. Everything you do to your neighbor, love, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's not just commandment 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. The reason for all that is that you will love your neighbor as yourself. Remember now your neighbor, the poor, love the poor as yourself. The penniless, love the penniless as yourself. The hungry, love the hungry as yourself. The naked, love the naked as yourself. The unfortunate in life, love the unfortunate in life as yourself. The one that is not coming to your synagogue, love the irreligious as yourself. The one that doesn't have any relationship with you, but is created by God, love all the creatures as yourself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these have I kept for my use of. What lack I yet? All these have I kept from my use. You mean that you have loved the poor as yourself? You have loved the penniless as yourself? Are you serious about that? You have loved the hungry as yourself? Is that truthful? You have loved the unfortunate, the downtrodden as yourself? All right, then. Let's see. Verse 21. Jesus said, Unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and demonstrate it, go and show it, go sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and give the practical evidence you love your neighbor, you love the poor as yourself, you love the downtrodden as yourself. You love the hungry and the naked as yourself. You love the widow and the fatherless and the orphan as yourself. Go sell what you have. If you were sick and your healing from the doctors demanded 
that you sold your property so that you can care for your health? Will you do it? Oh, yes. You love your neighbor as yourself? Go and sell what you have. Take care of them. And what you would have done for yourself, do it to them. Because you say, all this have I kept, have I done from my youth. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when the young man had that, the man that said, I've done it from my youth. I love my neighbor as myself. I love the poor, the fatherless, the widows as myself. And I've kept all the commandments of God. When he heard, go and prove it, go and show it, and demonstrate the love you have for your neighbor. And now you are keeping even the commandments of the Lord. We're not even talking now of the first four commandments unto God. We're just talking on the human level now. When he had that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. Let's come back to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we're reading now verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go sell, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Young man, that's not the final scene. Could you give all your money to the poor, and you don't follow Christ? You don't have eternal life yet? Could you sell everything you had, and give to the downtrodden? and give to the hungry, and give to the naked. If you don't come after Christ, you are not through yet. After you've done that, come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And the giver of eternal life. And the one that shows eternal life to people is the grace that flows and the mercy that flows through me that gives eternal life. And so you must come with everything you've done, Come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he was such at that same, and went away grieved, for he had great possession. The Lord is telling us something. When you say you are righteous by yourself, you are holy by yourself, and you have qualified yourself, and you have eternal life all by yourself, the Lord is going to say, no, you can't. No, you don't. And I'll prove it to you. That's what he did to the young man. In Proverbs chapter 30, we're reading from verse 12. There is a generation that appear in their own eyes. All this I have done. What like I yet? I'm a specimen of a good, religious, righteous, Synagogue attendant, church goer, what like I yet? There is a generation that appear in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. In sin did my mother conceive me. In sin, iniquity was I born. You need a cleansing. It's not just I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Isaiah tells us in chapter 64, Isaiah chapter 64, we're reading from verse 6. The young man said, I'm a righteous person by myself. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing. The things we do superficially on the surface without thinking of the rottenness of our heart, without thinking of the righteousness of our heart, we think we're doing right. I do this, I don't commit adultery, but if you look on the woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery in your heart. 
I don't steal. But if you steal the glory that belongs to God alone, you're a thief. I don't bear false witness. But if you bear a witness about God, about Christ, that is not true and factual, you bear false witness. But I do not covet. But if you envy your neighbor who has what you don't have, you're a covetous man. I don't worship idol. But if you hold on to money and you exaggerate the importance of money, of riches, more than you're following after God, you take money, you worship money as an idol. That's why it says, but we all are as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses in the plural as filthy rags in the sight of God, and we all fade, do fade as a leaf. And, over, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Look at Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, we're reading from verse 30. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. What's your glory? What's your joy? What's your testimony? On what are you basing your salvation? I pay tithes, uh huh. I do this, uh huh. I don't smoke, I don't drink. That's right. That's salvation. I come to church. That's salvation. I don't miss this. I don't miss that. That's salvation. Everything you do by yourself, there is nothing that can save you. For all you do by yourself will still have the stain of the Adamic nature. In Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 30. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained the law of righteousness. Israel, all the Israelites, they're the picture of this man. Or this man is the picture. Once I do this, then I have eternal life. Because they followed by themselves, in their own strength, in their own power, and they brought and they boasted, look at what I have done. Shouldn't I have eternal life? What you have done, no matter how high, will not give you or grant you eternal life. It says in Versace, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Why? For what reason? Because they sought it not by faith. They sought it in their own strength. They sought it in their own striving. They sought it by their own effort. They said, we don't need a savior. We don't need a messiah. We don't need a substitute. We don't need anybody to die for us. We can attain salvation by ourselves. We can have that eternal life by what we do. No, you cannot. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling block. They stumbled. Look at Romans chapter 6. We're reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now be made free from sin. Christ has to do that. You cannot do that by yourself. I do this, I don't do this. I, I, I. The I for salvation. 
cannot attain salvation. I'm pure by myself. I'm righteous by myself. I've made my way right by myself. I pay this money, I pay that money. I do this work, I do that work. Christ by atonement. Christ by sacrifice. Christ by the substitutionary sacrifice on the cross of Calvary has to make you righteous, has to forgive you. Let's say, for example, it were possible for you from age 15 to live a perfect life, impeccable, that you are just as righteous, as pure, as white, as snow, as good as an angel. If that were possible, it's not possible by yourself, in your own strength, if it were possible to live righteous, to live holy from a particular age on to the day of death, will you by that get to heaven? No. All the sins you committed from when you were young until that age 15 or age 20 or age 27 or age 40, when you said, I'm not going to say anything wrong, I'm not going to do anything wrong, I'm going to act, I'm going to live like an angel. All the sins you committed before that time still has to be atoned for. And if they are not atoned for, anything you say you're doing now in your own strength cannot have eternal life. Look at that, verse 22, be now made free. He has to make you free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the fruit of God, the gift of God, the gift of God, we don't earn this one. We don't buy this one. We don't qualify for this one. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the only way to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. It's by grace, by grace is the gift of God. Through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the one that gives us eternal life. Whatever we have done is not pure enough to earn eternal life. What shall I do? There's something Christ has done. And you must take note of that. It's not only what you do, but what he has done. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're reading from verse 5. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. The young man did not realize that. That rich man did not realize that. That man, that woman bragging about, I don't do evil. I don't hurt any people. My mind is plain. This is how my heart is. I'm simple. I'm sincere. I do my best, I help people, and I go to church, and I read the Bible, and I pray, and I fast, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, there must be a renewal in regeneration, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified 
by his grace. You see that? It's not something we earn. We're justified by his grace. We should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're coming back to Mark chapter 10. Point number two now. Reaping eternal loss through focus on the corruptible. Reaping eternal loss through focus on the corruptible. Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 22. And it was sad that many people, they come to ask a question about eternal life. They are asking because we assume they don't know. And they are asking from Christ because we think they suppose or they think that Christ ought to know. And now they have asked the Lord. And the Lord has given the appropriate answer for them. For them to have eternal life. And yet, after the right answer has been given to them, they are sad, and you are asking, wait a minute, why are you sad? You asked a question. Christ answered you, and he told you what to do. And the climax of what is said, the overall thing is, come to me. Because except you come to Christ, you cannot have eternal life. Take up your cross. People will persecute you. They will oppose you. They will stand as a stumbling block before you. But you take the stumbling block as a stepping stone and you keep on following me. That's the right answer. Why are you sad? They didn't hear what they wanted to hear. They wanted Christ to lift them up and to make them a showcase and say, see that man by himself, in his own strength, in his own power. He makes my coming. He makes my cross. He makes my crucifixion. He makes my death unnecessary. He can save himself. Look at the man. That's what the man expected. For the Lord to lift him up. Congrats. You have saved yourself without me. That's what he wanted to hear. But when he heard that there's no salvation in any other. There is no name. And there's no righteousness. That anybody can practice on earth and attain unto eternal life by himself, he must forsake all. He must abandon all. He must repent. He must turn away from even what he calls his goodness. And then he must come. He must take up his cross and follow me. When he had that, he was sad. Verse 22. And he was sad at that saying. And he went away grieved. For he had great possessions. He should have stayed to hear the final scene from Christ. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? They've never heard anything like that before. And maybe you've never heard anything like that before. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Why? Because the people that have riches, use the word, that possess riches, and their riches possess them. You see, money, wealth, and riches, they have a way of possessing the man, of having the man, of capturing the man. 
And the man who possesses riches, the man that riches possess, that his wealth has captured him, imprisoned him, his wealth has totally captivated him, and the wealth has hurt him. And now he thinks, everything he thinks, he thinks on the basis of riches. And in the house, he thinks of the riches building the house. I need health. He thinks of riches providing that health. And I need anything. I need a contact. I need a man. I need somebody. I need servants. He thinks of riches giving him everything. I want eternal life. He thinks of riches giving him that eternal life. I, ha I need heaven. And he thinks of riches. Riches, money will answer every matter in his life. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? And the disciples were astonished at his word. And they were so much astonished. But Jesus answered again and says unto them, Understand now, this is the real meaning of what Jesus said. So he clarified it in their heart. Children, how hard is it for them that, tell me the word there. Tell me, tell me. Let me hear you now. Let the others around you hear you well. That trust in riches, the trust. They don't put their trust in God, in riches. They don't put their trust in the mercy of God, they put it in riches. They don't put their trust in Christ, they put their trust in riches. They do not put their trust in the grace of God. I'm nothing without His grace. I'm nothing without the gift of eternal life. Uh-uh, I'm somebody. Have riches. They put their trust in riches. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man trusting in his riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And they were astonished out of measure. They were astonished before. But now with the explanation, knowing the nature of the rich people around them, knowing the attitude of the rich people around them, that those rich people, they don't trust anyone beyond them. They trust their riches. They don't understand money can buy bed, but money cannot buy sleep. They don't understand. Money can build a house, but money cannot raise a home. They don't understand. Money can buy books, but money cannot buy a sharp brain. They don't understand. Money can buy medicine, but money cannot buy health. They don't understand. Money can buy earthly things, but money cannot have heavenly things. And so, as Jesus gave the explanation, the people who thought money is all in all. Money can get you anywhere. Money can get you anything. Money can climb the ladder and pull you up the ladder and pull you into heaven. That's what they thought. Money can do everything. They were now astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? If the people who have money to buy Bibles cannot be saved by just buying a Bible, they have to read, they have to believe, they have to put their faith in the Christ to read of in the Bible. I bought the people that don't have money to buy the Bible, who then can be saved. If the people that have a transportation to go to a church, to go to a synagogue, 
if they can go to church you see their transportation about the people that don't have transportation who then can be saved if the people that have the way and the green light to come to Christ and they can come and they're bold and they're audacious and they do not inherit eternal life but the people that don't even have the courage to come who then can be saved that's the way they thought and Jesus looking upon them says with men it is impossible with men it is impossible but not with God God can so touch the heart of any man can so transform the heart of any man, can so lead them away from trusting their riches and trusting God, believing in God, and they can still get to heaven. It's God can, that can do that, but with God, not with God, or with God, all things are possible. With God, somebody help me complete that. You can save anyone. And he will save all those who have come to him here today in Jesus' name. And what was the problem of that man? The problem of that man is that he focused on the corruptible, focused on silver and gold. He focused on money. He focused on wealth. Look at First Peter. First Peter. I'm reading from chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 18. From verse 18, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, not saved, not justified, not forgiven, not cleansed, not given eternal life on the basis of corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. That's the only way of salvation. Your money cannot save you. Everything you have cannot save you. They are corruptible in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 49. In Psalm 49, we're reading from verse 6. Psalm 49, reading from verse 6. They that trust in their wealth, like that man, they that trust in their riches, like the man was talking about, they that trust in their possession, like the man we're reading about, like many people today, although they go to church, they just go to church as formality. If you ask them, how do you know you are going to heaven? Oh, they say, my good works are greater than my bad works. They say, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not like an ordinary sinner. I do this, I do this, I do this. I pay my due in our church. I give tithes and offering in our church. I give money to the beggars. I do the best I can. You know what? It's true I'm rich, but I use my riches for good purposes. I use my wealth for good purposes. They trust in their wealth. They trust in their riches. But look at verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. They boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother. They cannot redeem themselves, and they cannot redeem any relative. They cannot redeem any neighbor, none of them. None of them. None of the rich people. 
none of the people of power, people of wealth, none of the prosperous, prospered people, none of them by any means can redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, so precious, only the blood of a substitute, a perfect substitute, can atone for their sins and can give them eternal life. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, they are in what thought? is that their houses shall continue forever. Their inward thought is that their money, their wealth, their riches will build something that will endure and continue forever. And their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. It's like a beast that perish. This their way is their folly. This their thought is their foolishness. This their reliance on riches, their trust in riches, their trust in wealth is their folly. Yet their prosperity approve their sins. Their, prosperity, their posterity, the people around them still think they're doing the right thing. I pray God will open the eyes of everyone in Jesus' name. Psalm 52. In Psalm 52, reading from verse 7. Psalm 52, verse 7. Lo, this is the man that made not God is strength. This is the man that made not God his salvation. This is the man that made not God his life eternal, but trusted, trusted, trusted in the abundance of his riches. I'm asking you now, what do you trust? Who do you trust? What do you think is the basis of you inheriting everlasting life, eternal life? Do you think it's your riches? Do you think it's your goodness? Do you think it's what you do without Christ? Do you think it's your not wearing this and wearing that? Do you think it's your not drinking this, not smoking that? Do you think it's by your own strength, by your own power? Do you think it's by the things you brag about, what you have, what you possess, or what possesses you that you trust in, that is going to give you eternal life? Is God in your thought? Is God in your faith? Is God in your trust? No. This is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthens himself in his wickedness. Whatever else they're doing, they strengthen themselves because they think money will buy everything. Possession will buy everything. Position will buy everything. Jeremiah, we're reading from chapter 9, Jeremiah, chapter 9, Verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, let not the rich man glory in his riches, trust in his riches, be possessed by his riches. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorious glory in this, 
that he understands and knows me as Savior, as the one that so loved the world, he gave a Redeemer, he gave a Savior, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, trust in God, believe in God, believe in Christ, and don't make your riches to be a substitute for the Savior, a replacement of the Savior, thinking that your riches will save you. He that glorious, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness, and in the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 16, Luke chapter 12, we're reading from verse 16. In verse 16, hear the words of Christ, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man, rich man, brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, if he has read the scriptures, nothing he read in the scriptures came into what he thought within himself. If he goes to church, if he's churchgoer, nothing he has heard in the church comes to his thought within himself. If he has heard any message from any preacher, nothing he has heard comes into his thought within himself. Rich men have a way of being possessed by their riches obsessed with their riches and captivated, captured, imprisoned by their riches. And they can only think in terms of what they earn, what they have, what they, po what they possess, what possesses them. In verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down, I, I, I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I, I, I all the time. The rich people are so full of themselves. What are they looking for? They can command servants. What are they looking for? They can buy anything. What are they looking for? They can build anything. What are they looking for? They can have contacts, long leg, long arm. What are they looking for? Anything earthly, anything on earth, they think they can possess by themselves. And their thought and their language is full of I. When you come to Christ, that's what God crosses out of your life. He crosses that I, so that you can now say, it's no more I that live, but Christ liveth in me. But while you're still in your natural self, unsaved or backsliding, you're full of yourself, and it says there, will I bestow all my fruits, and my goods, everything mine, 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 I, I, I. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God, who he, who, who he forgot, but God who only is the source of his salvation, but God, who only is the giver of eternal life, but God, who is, who is only the only provider of salvation, but God, whom he had forgotten, 
but God whom he was not thinking about, but God who was not in his thoughts, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He is going to a lost eternity because he trusts in riches. Verse 21, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich, is not rich, is not rich towards God. How? Is not rich in faith. How? Is not rich in thought, in a trust. How? Is not rich in the kingdom of God. Is not rich. He has not given his soul to Christ. For Christ to give him the only riches that is eternal salvation. A foolish man, a foolish woman that puts all the focus, all the trust on things they have on earth and they are not rich towards God. How about you? Think about yourself. You claim you are saved, but you think of that salvation and the greatest riches you have. You say you are sanctified. Do you think of that sanctification as the greatest possession you have? You think of the Holy Ghost in feeling, in dwelling, baptism in the Holy Ghost. Do you think of the guidance of that Holy Ghost as the greatest guide you have? Or do you just say that by word of mouth? But in your life, in your behavior, in everything, you rely on yourself. You trust in yourself. You have solution for everything. You have answer for everything. And Christ, the Savior, is not in your thoughts. If you die in that condition, it will be eternal loss. Point number three, retaining eternal life through fellowship with the crucified. Retaining eternal life through fellowship with the crucified. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're reading from verse 28. Then Peter began to say, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Understand? When Peter and the rest of the apostles heard that those said that that man went away sorrowful and sad, then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Please understand? Take everything together. We have left all. If you stopped there, that one does not earn salvation. We have left all. And we're living now on the charity of people. That one does not bring salvation. We have left all. And we have followed thee. We have followed thee, the Savior. We have followed thee, the Provider. We have followed thee, the healer. We have followed thee, everything we have left. What we get from you is not to be compared with what we have left. Because now, as we seek forth the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these will be added unto us. As we have left all and we are following you, you are the owner. You are the possessor of all things. And as we're following you, we're not going to get hungry. As we're following you, we're not going to remain naked. As we're following you, we're not going to remain poor. As we're following you, we're not going to remain sick. We have, we have followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake. Not just to leave all the people that can leave many things, because an idol told them to leave that thing. Don't eat beans. 
Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Because the idol of your family does not want anybody eating that. And they leave that thing. That one does not give you eternal life. For my sake, and the gospels, and the gospels sake, will leave this because they hinder the gospel. They hinder our following the Lord. And they hinder our obeying the Lord. It says, but he shall receive an hundredfold now. In this time, how is this? That man that went away sorrowful did not understand the provision of the Lord, the substitution of grace, and the provision of the riches of the kingdom. He thought, I live all, I follow Christ, and then that means I'm going to be living from hand to mouth. I'm going to be living like a poor beggar. He didn't understand. There are many people that hear one part of the scriptures, and they have not heard the other part. And the part they have heard has so annoyed them, made them sad, that they run away, and they run away to perdition. You will not run away to perdition. I can't hear your amen. I think sometimes you forget you are now in 2020. Now, remember 2020, amen. Where is that? Yeah. Verse 13, and his he shall receive an hundredfold when? Tell me. Now in this life, houses, brethren, sisters, brothers, children, lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, tell me, eternal life. I need to point something out to you. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, there is no man that has left, tell me, or tell me, or tell me, or tell me, or say it, or the next one. What? Or what? Why? Everybody shout, why? Many people are not married there. If you are married, shout, why? Now, the left this, 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 and why? Because of, because of persecution, because of the gospel. Look at verse 30. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this life. Tell me. Tell me again, brethren, and tell me another. Sisters, and tell me again, mothers, and tell me again. And tell me again, something is missing here. It's not going to give your wives, your arch, one wife. If because of the gospel, the separation, you will make reconciliation. And you go back to that wife. Because the Lord may give you houses, may give you brethren. We give you sisters, even mothers in the Lord. We give you children in the Lord. We give you lands. And you may have persecution, but you're not going to have wives. The Lord is very clear in what he says and in what he teaches. And then he says in verse 31, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Amen. I pray you will not be last. Why did Jesus say many that are first shall be last? The people who have believed long ago, they first believed. They were fervent. They were hot for the Lord. They were prayerful. They were obedient to the Lord. They were submissive to the Lord. But the higher they go, the cooler they become. 
the more they have been trusting the Lord, and the more they have been following after the Lord, now they slow down. And the people that are just coming in now, and the first, they are forced, uh, they, they are last, because they are just coming in, uh, their fervency, and their hotness of faith, and their submission, and their obedience becomes so great, they overtake the people who have believed for a long time, who are no more fervent, who are no more dedicated, who are no more submissive. I pray that those who are coming now at the last time will not overtake you or surpass you in Jesus' name. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What's the Lord asking for? The Lord is asking for crucifixion. That he was crucified, and as he was crucified, he left everything. You will be like him. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When you are crucified with Christ, all the things of this world will not be so important. You are holding on to it with a tight hand, and you are not willing to miss anything. You rather go and uh, for that business uh, contact and that business or whatever reaches instead of coming to the Lord. When you are really crucified with the Lord, which is what the Lord is expecting of everyone, that none of these things will hold you down. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lost. They that belong to Christ, you remain crucified. Crucify the flesh and the affections and the laws. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. When you come to Christ, you might still have your house, you might still have your property, you might still have everything you've got, but you hold them with a loose hand. Shall Christ demand them? Shall Christ say, give to the poor? Shall Christ say, feed the hungry? Shall Christ say, clothe the naked? Shall Christ say, help your neighbor? You hold that thing with a loose hand. You are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. You are not holding anything so tight. You cannot give up because of the calling of God upon your life. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Our old man that will hold this tight. Our old man that will hold money tight. Our old man that is stingy. Our old man that is selfish. Our old man that is self-centered. And we cannot give up anything to help the poor and to help the fatherless and to help the widows, an old man that is so self-centered that one is crucified now knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we shall not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin that new life the Lord will give to everyone in Jesus' name. And whatever the Lord requires that you ought to give up, you give up 
cheerfully. You give up willingly. There's nothing you're holding in your hand that you say, I'm benefiting from this, I'm benefiting from that. Sometimes it's even a wrong thing. Sometimes it's even a bad thing that is hurting other people. You give them up without thinking, ah, if I give that up, how will I continue to have this and that? We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 9. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. And it says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. That's why Paul the Apostle gave up whatever will still look like it was having its own righteousness, having its own way. Look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, Jewish religion, but what things were gained to me, my position among the Pharisees, but what things were gained to me, my authority of having letters and, you know, going here and there and pouncing on people, what things were gained to me, in religion, those I counted laws for Christ, I give them up. Never ye doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the laws of all things, and do count them dung but dung, that I may win Christ that I may win Christ. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading from verse 24. Hebrews 11. Reading from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave up that one. That's greater than riches, that's royalty. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches, esteeming the reproach, the persecution, esteeming all he suffered for the sake of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured a sin him who is invisible. I pray that that same grace, that same faith, the Lord gave to all those worthies of old, will give to us in Jesus' name. We'll not hold to everything, anything so tight that will allow them to conflict with our salvation, with our eternal life, with our trusting the Lord, with our depending upon the Lord. And whatever God requires that we give up for, the, for gospel's sake and for Christ's sake, we'll give up without being sad, like that foolish rich man in Jesus' name. And when you put the kingdom of God first, and you put God first, and you put Christ first in your life, whatever you lose, the Lord will multiply a hundredfold to give unto you in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not things on the earth. Set your affection, your love, your focus on things above, not things on the earth. Not on money, not on riches, not on houses. Not on lands, not on property, not certificates. Have them as the Lord permits, but don't set your faith, your heart on them. 
And don't put them beyond and above your salvation, your eternal life, and your growth in Christ. Don't put any of the things of this life above your earthly, your heavenly inheritance. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That heaven you will not miss in Jesus' name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and eternal life will be yours. Abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, that eternal life will remain until Christ comes for every one of us to go into his kingdom in Jesus' name. I'll be wise, I will not be foolish. I will be wise, I will not be foolish. The wise hold on to eternal life. Don't allow anything on earth to take eternal life from you. Let's rise up now and pray. Talk to the Lord in prayer. God loves everyone. And he wants everyone to have eternal life. God loves everyone. He wants you to inherit eternal life. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And after you are saved, don't replace that eternal life salvation with riches or the things of this world. Abide in the Lord, endure unto the end. And so will you retain, so will you abide in that eternal life until it comes.